So today I'm joined by Thomas Shaw Dunn. So Thomas is the CEO of Retainer Group, who provide a tailored and unique security system to mark and protect vehicles and, and also other valuable assets. So welcome, Thomas. Thank you, Simon. Thank great, you. great to have you on here today. Thanks. So, Thomas, tell us a bit more about the Retainer Group. So Retainer Group was founded in 1982 by, um, uh, well, on the back of, uh, we were founded in 1982 by our uh, current owner. We've mm -hmm. been family owned all along. And it was on the back of an invention of a glass etching fluid. Now, the glass etching fluid is the same one we still use today. And it will etch to 0.2 of a millimetre into glass but it won't harm any other substance. So if you spill it on your skin or on your clothing or on the paintwork of a vehicle, it does no damage whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so it gets you away from all heap of health and safety, cost legislation and all sorts. Um, then using that basis, we started with VIN etching on vehicle windows. Mm -hmm. After doing that for two years, realized VIN etching doesn't work anymore uh, or doesn't work as a security solution. So went to our system. Um, and then since then, we've employed our system on all sorts of asset tags, vehicle marking, um, as you say, uh, any item of value. We can etch any bare metal, painted metal, glass or plastic mm -hmm. um, with either a UV mark or an etched mark or some rather intelligent uh, label technology, which can leave a mark behind if you manage to get them off and they fragment into all sorts of pieces when you try and take them off. So really clever solutions, all of them making sure that they're completely safe to handle. Um, and then the system is that you get a unique code for that asset. So whether it's a tool, whether it's a jet ski, a bicycle, a laptop, um, part of your business asset register or uh, a vehicle, um, we give you a unique code that unique code is registered with your details and the item details on the International Security Register, which is our database. That database links directly into the Police National Computer in the UK and the same in um, the Federal Computer in the US and similar in Sweden and across the world. We, we operate like that so that if you suffer a theft, then we immediately see the police report. We then tell the police that is this person's asset, it's marked, it's registered. Um, we can join the dots so that if it gets recovered, then not only do you get your item back, but the police get successful prosecution. We provide the witness statement to make sure that you get the actual prosecution behind that. Um, over the last 42 years, we have got 100% guilty verdict. Wow. Um, to put that into uh, context, because there's a lot of companies that claim that and then they've had zero prosecutions that have actually come to light. So to put it into uh, into context, that's 404 prosecutions directly as a response, re result of our evidence in 2023. Um, it's a lot more indirect. Uh, we take about 10 calls an hour through our register um, from police checking up on assets and doing lookups, um, be a vehicle at the side of the road or something in a lockup that they've just found. Uh, very simple, 24-7 phone line. Even Christmas Day, we're on the phone line. Um, taking them calls and, and helping repatriate the goods. Okay. You would not believe, if you go into a police station, the number of bicycles that are there because they can't repatriate them to the owners. They just they know who owns it, but they can't prove who owns it, so therefore they can't return it, and then eventually it gets into a police auction. So that's the benefit of the system um and then every business you require tacit tag so we offer that as a system where you just put your put your labels on and then you get the asset register you need for your iso qualification and you get the security protection yeah um, okay. so, the, so the benefit is that you're a, you're more likely to get the asset back again and 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 secondly there's more likely to be a prosecution um for the the person that's committed the the, the the crime so it's great and by the way i had a look at your your website and i love the you know looking at those um you know and we've probably all seen them those those sort of like slightly uh like they look slightly metallic type of stickers that can go on things but 
I, I love the fact that it showed on your website where you where people might try to peel it off. It still leaves a it's really difficult. So the label breaks when it when it comes off, but but also it leaves a mark behind so that you can still read the the number that was allocated to that, even if they've tried to take the the sticker off. So which I thought was really you know re really clever and great. So um, yeah, um, great stuff. Okay, so. So I'd like to, to find out a bit about you, first of all, Thomas. So, you know, from from what I've seen, you you actually started as a as an engineer. I think you were you were an engineer at Siemens, were you at one stage? Yeah, I was. So I started off as an engineer at Siemens. I then moved to SSE um, as an asset manager, then to Alstom um, uh, as a salesman and then as head of engineering department uh, and then G bought Alstom, so I did a period of time in GE before going into the consulting in the Middle East, mm -hmm. where I designed and built power stations, desalination plants, things like that. Then came back um, to run uh, a nuclear division across here uh, on nuclear power. Uh, I actually moved into a house next door to Wendy, who founded Retainer Group. Okay. Um, met her in the pub, and then she invited me up to see what she did. And after twelve months of uh, bit to in and fro in we uh, we came to an agreement where i've come on board to to run a business for us so yeah right. <laughs> and, and, and i'll pick up on that part in a second because i'm interested in 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 the whys and wherefores in terms of your role at retainer group but the first thing i'd, I'd like to focus on here is that so you you mentioned a number of different roles there not just for different businesses but you know engineer salesperson you're now, uh, and then sort of, you know, being a general manager and, and, and a leader, and now you're a, a CEO at Retainer Group. So was that a plan of yours to, um, to you know, ultimately become a, a leader of a, of a business? Because, you know, it's not necessarily what everybody sort of plans to do, but or has it just happened naturally? It's just happened naturally. Yeah, I've had no plan whatsoever. Um, I... I ended up doing electrical engineering at university because electronics was the school the subject I enjoyed most at school and just carried on going. And then, yeah, I, uh, opportunities have come along and I've just not said no. Okay. And okay. it's, uh, if there's a good opportunity, then I take it, be prepared to move around with it and, uh, see what happens. And yeah, there's just no plan about it at all. Uh, okay. there's the, yeah. I think the, I've only applied for two of the jobs that I've had formally, I think. Um, and the rest has been done through meeting people generally in a pub. Uh, <laughs> okay, great. It's, 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 um, as they say, it's not necessarily always what you know, it's who you know. So, um, you know, a, a, a great lesson there into, yeah, make sure you speak to people around you and talk to people and find out what they're up to because opportunities arise um so i like that so um so thomas the, um you know the role the role of a an engineer is obviously very different to the role of a of a ceo so what would you say are you know is the most important role of a of a ceo a ceo is the because you need someone legally responsible for the company that's going to put his neck on the block whenever a decision needs making mm -hmm. and can do all the reporting and the administrative side of the business. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a very different role being CEO of Retainer Group, which is a SME, um, albeit we work internationally and across the globe. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh, we've got 32 employees based on two sites in mm -hmm. Kent, whereas being CEO of Tractor Bell Middle East, when I was doing that as a consultancy and you're interacting with the board of a uh, huge conglomerate, you know, France's sixth biggest company at the time, um, mm -hmm. very different roles and responsibilities there. And CEO of an SME, you're a salesman, you're an engineer, you're an IT support, you're uh, doing a lot of legal stuff, HR stuff, whatever comes on. Uh, when you've got 30 employees, you've not got someone to say, oh, that, that falls into that bucket or that falls into that bucket. You've got to um, 
make sure that you, you can turn your hand to anything. Um, as an engineer, you're very structured. You've, mm -hmm. you've sort of programmed to be very, very structured um, and to work in a set where if you are going to come out of that world and certainly into sales, you need to be able to be flexible and adaptable. And I think the skill set that is the most important in that is the not just the flexibility it's about the communication with people to make sure that mm -hmm. you understand what you're doing and they understand what you're doing and you understand what they're doing and as long as you've got that i think that you you find moving forward okay Thanks. great so 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 we've got a thing there so yeah different there's different being a ceo to a large you know multinational business to to an sme um, you know, with an SME, if I'm you know, correct in saying you've got to you've got to be able to, you know, uh, be prepared to roll your sleeves up and get involved in a bit of a bit of everything. But primarily some things that you mentioned there is, um, you know, you mentioned decision making. You've got to be making, good at decision making. You've got to be good at reporting. And above all that you said there, good at communication. Um, why? Why in particular communication, Thomas? Um well, because I'm from Yorkshire, as you can probably guess by the accent, <laughs> uh, uh, then you would probably be absolutely outstanding to hear that people don't always just perfectly understand the Yorkshire accent and the Yorkshire way of, way of working. So missing out the words of such as the can uh, could cause confusion. Um, even at Retainer Group in the office here, the sales office, we've got um, three different nationalities. Uh, in the register, we've got a number of different different national other nationalities. I think we've got six or seven different places of origin from mm -hmm. different countries, just in the 32 people that we have employed here. Mm. Um, in my past, where I've worked for international companies, where you've got people based, thousands of people based in each country, again, people's English is all different. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was once working with a French engineer, uh, sorry, an Indian engineer, and we drove from Abu Dhabi to Dubai, mm -hmm. had a meeting, and then was driving back. So we'd been together probably five or six hours in the car and then in a meeting and then back in the car. And this Indian engineer turned around to me and says, so what type, of, what part of France are you from? <laughs> <laughs> and that sort of struck me there as the English language is very, very powerful, mm. but equally we have a lot of words that mean the same thing mm -hmm. and we have in both spelling and in both pronunciation so you have to be very clear in what you are wanting so that everyone's driving in the right direction yeah. so what i've found is when you when you say something and you say to someone have you understood they'll say yes you ask them to repeat it back to you and you go no i didn't mean that <laughs> so, yeah i think that that's that's you know, it's a great point, and it links, you know, to something that a phrase that I always use, which is communication is the response you get. Okay, so and um, you know, which means that if somebody hasn't understood what you've said, it's because of the way that you've said it. Okay, so we often look, um, it's like looking through the window and looking in the mirror. So we quite often, if somebody hasn't understood what we've said, we often look at through the window. And, and sort of go, well, it's their fault that they didn't understand what I said. But actually what we should be doing is looking in the mirror and saying, how could I communicate that better so that they do understand it? What, you know, what language can I use? And, you know, and I don't necessarily mean, uh, you know, what foreign language that I can use, but, you know, what, how can I communicate it in a way that, that they will understand it? Do I use, you know, some people are very vision um, orientated. So do I do I use a diagram? Some people are very kinesthetic. So do I show them how to do something? Some people are very, very auditory. So they're, they're more, uh, you know, they, they, they like listening to language and things. So I, I, I love what you said. And I like the bit that you said there, um, Thomas, about um, getting them to re repeat back to you. That's how you know, isn't it, that somebody's understood what you've said. That's the only way to do it. Yeah. The only way. Yeah, I like it. That's, yeah. Um, you know, I, I always think that's a, um, you know, when I speak to my clients and we talk about delegation and we go through the steps of, um, you know, effective delegation, the very last one, well, not so much the very last one, but the last one in communicating about the delegation um, is 
to get them to repeat it back to you. Um, and until they can repeat it back to you and you both go, yep, yeah, that's it. You keep going over and repeating it, repeating it. Right. No, this is what I meant. Let me clarify that point. Because quite often than not, it's, it's, it's as you said there, Thomas, that as they're repeating it back to you, they might then suddenly go, oh, actually, I thought I understood it, but I don't. Could you explain it again? So a great part of the process. And I think that's something great bit of advice for everyone that, that, that you've shared there. So, so Thomas, what do you see as the main challenges that you face as a, as a, a as a CEO of, um, you know, of, of an SME, but it, but it's still a reasonable size business. I mean, you said there are 32 employees across two sites. It's not without its challenges. What, what, what do you see as, uh, what challenges do you face as CEO? Um, <sighs> The, the biggest challenge is always securing the next order mm. and keeping it going. So we've got 22 million vehicles on the register, 30 million assets, a um, couple of million bicycles. That That's the size of the database. Mm. So you've got obvious risks in cybersecurity and everything else. But for me, the biggest risk to the business is sustainability. Mm -hmm. And that data is there in perpetuity once there's an asset logged on the register we never delete because you need to mark it as destroyed so that if it reappears then you know that um certainly i mean less important with something like a laptop if you destroy your laptop and mark it destroyed it's gone mm. if you destroy a vehicle and mark it destroyed then if that vehicle then reappears on the uh, road and you see it then someone's ringed the uh, vin number off it and uh ringed it back into circulation so okay, there's, yeah. a, there's been a car theft at some point in that cycle so yeah. you it sits on there in perpetuity there's a cost to that there's a cost to the staff there's a cost to the factory uh, that makes all the fluids labels and adhesives for us so you've always got to have that next order mm -hmm. now we're, we're very lucky in retainer group in that we've got base orders with some very good clients some uh, big vehicle manufacturers that just mm -hmm. do etching and really support the system but aside from that you've got to look at how we grow how we develop and how we keep the business on an upward trajectory okay great so that's one of the that's one of the main challenges that sustainable growth because um and again as i say to my clients we can't stand still if you stand still then you're um effectively you're going backwards because everything around you is moving forward so actually even to just stand still you've still got to be moving forward so sustainable sustainable growth um and is that is that one of the main things that because um actually i didn't clarify at the beginning you you joined uh retainer group about eight months ago am i right in saying that yeah something yeah. like that yeah yeah so is that one of the things that um, the board of Retainer Group said, right, okay, Thomas, one of the things we want you to focus on is sustainable growth. It's the the thing that I was asked to focus on really mm. was to look after the company and look after the people in the company. Okay. That, that was the brief I was given. Yeah, um, so you, yeah. by default, that means you've got to do sustainable growth because as you say, it's uh, mm. cost of living goes up, minimum wage jumps up, you've got to grow to cover that cost. <laughs> database expands you've got to grow to cover that cost so you you have to have that slow sustainable growth what i wouldn't want was sort of to put on two million pounds in one year um bearing in mind selling uh selling little little labels you've got to sell a lot for two million pound um but if you want to throw that on and double the size of the company in in 12 months uh whereas some of us would think oh brilliant yeah 100 percent growth in a year that's Absolutely awesome. If you do it there, then you're not set up for it. You're going to set yourself up for fail. Mm. So it's about maintaining the quality and the integrity of the product and the system, looking after the clients and making sure that what we sell is correct, but mainly prioritizing the company and the people that work for us. Uh, and that's the been the heart of how Wendy's built the company over the last 42 years. Like it. Okay. So there's a couple of things I've picked up that from that Thomas so first of all um yeah what, what you sort of said there is and and quite often you you know you, you're absolutely right the focus is on is on growth let's double the size of this uh business or whatever it may be but unless you've got a platform to grow from 
So, you know, the, the, the systems and processes and everything that you need to grow, it's best not to grow. Um, get, the, get the platform, the structure, everything in place before you start to, to grow. So I like, I like that. Don't just grow for growth's sake. But let's look at that bit that you mentioned about look after the company and the people within the company. Um, so you mentioned that that's been Wendy's sort of philosophy. Why, why is that important? Why do you see it as important? Um, people are important and mm. there's no one will ever measure success in the same way that you as an individual measure success. Great, yeah. So, you know, some people it's about having a Ferrari. Some people it's about having a huge house. Some people it's about being able to make a difference on the climate or impact in their, that region or public sector, public way of life, whatever it be, everyone's version of success is very tailored. Mm. And I think my version of success is managing to spend enough time with my little baby and my family, mm -hmm. um, as much time as I possibly can with them. Not too much time tied to a desk, but still meet the demands that all the customers need, mm -hmm. um, that the business needs, and make sure that my staff get the same level of support in doing that. So it's people have been at the heart of everything we've done. Wendy, who set the company up, also founded a charity called Manga Kalara um, that take orphans off the street, baby orphans off the street in Bangalore, and they educate them to degree level before letting them back out with a, a solid founding education for them to find a job and move on with and change their lives. Fantastic. Um, and companies always had a lot of uh, to do with... Um, uh, find a voice which is a communications charity helping people communicate um uh with that otherwise can't so if they've had a stroke and lost the ability to talk or something like that early onset dementia things like that giving them the facilities to be able to do that so that's been the company charity side yeah and that's where we've we follow through we're looking after our own people as well as anyone that we can so there's a real there's a real alignment there, isn't there, between the the company's values and and the the charities that you support. Because you know you mentioned earlier about communication that's important in the business, and you support a charity that's focused on communication. You mentioned that people are are, are really important to the business, and and the company focuses on a a charity that that helps people. So yeah, there's a real alignment there, but between the two so um if you could how would you summarize what it is that you believe is necessary to focus on your people because you've got 32 people across two different sites you know that that can be quite a challenge to manage and lead that amount of people what, what how would you sort of summarize what what it is that you do or your company does to do that um well it's knowing them so mm -hmm. Um, out of them 32 people, I've been here eight months. Uh, we took on a graduate this Jan, 1st of January this year. Mm -hmm. So she's been here, what, three months now. Mm -hmm. um, aside from us two, the average length of service is 27 years. <laughs> so it's we're obviously getting something right in how we're training, developing, and retaining them people. Um, those people are technical manager has been here since he left school as has his mm -hmm. factory manager um and in looking after the people in actually knowing them knowing their families understanding what they need from us mm -hmm. then that's how we retain the staff and how we make sure we're doing right by them okay so a big focus there on on employee retention making sure that they're getting what they need so they want to carry on working for you and adding value to to the business that then and i guess through that that then has the positive and knock-on effect which as you as you sort of said before that actually um it's that that underpins the sustainability of the, the company because the companies to support your uh your uh, uh your employees the company needs to be sustainable and continue to grow and those sort of things so actually it's sort of everything underpins everything else yeah, that's it. And uh, well, would you like to meet as chief morale officer? Come here. Mm. Come on. Come on. There we go. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> Marina, good girl. 
bring me around good. the office. And, um, yeah. So, yeah. It's uh, little things like that make people a bit happier at work. And uh, it's, uh, as you say, as you get to know them, you get to know what you need to do to support because it's not all financial. It's the finances help. We have traditionally always paid above minimum wage, even for the uh, production line staff. Mm. But uh, there's only so much that money can do and there's only so much money an SME can give out. So you've got to look other ways of how you you help the teams. Yeah, like there's, um, I can't remember what they are off the, the top of my head, but there's been a lot of research on this. Um, and what the, the, what the research sort of summarises, that as long as you pay, or not, as long as a company pays... Um, a market salary okay then people won't generally look around for another job or move to another job with more pay as long as you're satisfying their other needs which are things like um, enjoying the job that they do interest in work uh, the ability to, um, uh, to to learn new things and to, 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 to move on in their career if they if they want to do that flexibility so if you've got all of those other things right, and you're as long as you're offering a market salary, even if somebody gets offered a lot more money, they're less likely to move because of all the other things that you that you offer. And it sounds as though that's what you and your company are really focused on. Yeah, it's I don't know anyone that's ever moved simply for money. Once you've got enough money, it's not a driver at all. It's no. uh, you we think we come to work for money, but actually spending a lot more than half your life here, you need to enjoy it and get a lot more out of it. In my entire career as a manager, I've only ever lost one person that I've wanted to retain. And he went because um, the customer actually poached him and we're offering him double the salary that he was mm. on or pretty much that. And he actually sat with me and apologized that he was putting his notes in and said, I know I'm making the wrong decision. It's very short term. <laughs> And I know that with you, I'd be earning a lot more than this in five years, but I can't wait five years. It's uh, I've got outside pressures that mean I need to take it now. Um, and I know it's the wrong decision. And you think, you know, that's the only person that's ever lo- left one of my teams that I've wanted to retain. Right. Um, a great so, track record to, 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 to be able yeah. to say. So, look, there's one question that I like to ask everybody that I, you know, that I speak to on these uh, on these sessions, and that is, What's the best advice that you would give an 18-year-old you? Um, I've got to be careful in my language here. <laughs> <laughs> if I, I wouldn't speak to an 18-year-old me. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's listen to people that have got the experience, mm-hmm. slow down. Moving too fast isn't always a good thing. I think when I first started at Siemens, I want to be running the whole Siemens by week four, I think I thought I could do it. Mm-hmm. And uh, you get hooked up in a lot, especially when you join big organizations that have got people that have been there a long time. Mm-hmm. So engineers that generally get a job for life. And even now an engineer starts a job and then the type of person that an engineer is, generally you don't like too much personal interaction. So you generally you're not going to move a lot of jobs. You get to into the 50s, late 50s, and they become very bitter and grumpy people. Mm. And you, I've seen a lot of them in my career sat at the desk, miserable that they're there. And you as a young engineer coming into that, get sucked on into this is wrong, that's wrong, management's wrong, management's mm. always wrong, uh, especially in Newcastle where I started. You know, you might as well have had the red flag outside um, <laughs> Union territory. Um, but you then, well, if it's all wrong, the type of people, the person that I am, I want to fix it. So if that's all wrong and I'm convinced that management are wrong, I can do a better job. And mm. that's how I got to be the youngest head of in Alstom at mm. that level, which was sort of just, I think, probably called directors now with title inflation. But um, mm. um, yeah, I think that's where I got sucked along into my career and then I get in, into a job at uh, very near uh, the top of uh, a huge company. You're getting a lot of money mm-hmm. and you suddenly realize that actually in the last three months, I've spent three nights in the same bed as my wife. This mm-hmm. is not what I want from life. Um, but having said that, it has funded 
quite a quite a good life. So I I'd just try and slow myself down a little bit looking backwards. I like I like that. Some good advice there. So slow down. I think you know that I picked up from from there. Um, learn from people around you, um, and that could be learning how not to do things. Okay, so it might be looking around you and saying, well, actually, I don't, I, you know, the, the way that person does that, I'm, you know, isn't my way of doing it thing. I think there's way, a bit different or better ways of doing that. But but learn from people around you and learn from the people that have got that experience. But, and then I like the other thing that you sort of said there is that actually think about what you want out of life. Yeah, is it, you know, is it all about money or what else is important to you? Family, friends. Um, all of those sort of things as well and get the right balance because it picks up something that you said um, earlier, Thomas, that everybody's definition of success is different. Yeah. So what, what I would, how I would define success for, for me would be different in terms of how you would define success for you. And, um, and we, you know, cause we quite often look at pop stars and movie stars and think they've been successful. They might've been successful in their career, but have they been successful? They quite often say that they're not happy in their life or, you know, whatever it may be. So is that truly success? So I, I, I like what you sort of said earlier as well is, is actually have your own definition of success. What, is, what does success mean for you personally and aim to achieve that, what it is for you? So so thank you for, for sharing that, Thomas. Um, and look, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with me today and sharing more about you know, uh, retainer group and also your journey as well. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Simon. Good.